Well, good afternoon and welcome to today's very special session of Virtual Talk with Tracy May Chambers in celebration of Archives Awareness Week brought to you by the Archives of Ontario. And a good afternoon to all of those that are joining from around the province of Ontario today. Just before we get to our first presenter, I want to make sure we take that opportunity and remind you of some of the features of Teams Live events so that you can take full advantage. If you're an individual that would like to take advantage of the artificial intelligent closed captioning today, I would ask that you just move your mouse on your screen. When you move that mouse, you're going to see a little CC button appear. If you click on that, you're going to start to see the Microsoft artificial intelligent closed captioning coming to you in English. There's a little gear to the right hand side of that. If you click on that, it will allow you to toggle between English and French if you would prefer it in French. Outside of that, we're also using the uh, Microsoft Teams live Q&A today because there will be some uh, time for some audience questions later on. If, uh, if it's not down the right hand side of your screen right now, up at the top, you've got a little uh, bubble with a question mark in it and a little Q&A on it. If you can click on that and you can start to ask your questions there and those will be relayed through to our uh, speaker this morning and uh, we'll look forward to that session as it comes uh, about but it is a special day and we want to get things started off right so please welcome our first presenter for today this is Allison Little good afternoon Allison good afternoon Rob thank you so much and good afternoon everyone and welcome to today's event featuring artist Tracy May Chambers uh, discussing her work and specifically her Hope and Healing Canada project and its current installation at the Archives of Ontario. I want to especially welcome Tracy May and say thank you for being here to discuss your work uh, with our audience today. So my name is Alison Little and I am the Senior Coordinator Educational Programming and Exhibitions at the Archives. Joining us also today from the Archives are John Roberts, Chief Privacy Officer and Archivist of Ontario, and Lainey Wilson, Curator of the Government of Ontario Art Collection, and we'll hear from each of them in a moment. Now, before we begin, I would like to offer a land acknowledgement. In a virtual setting where we are stretched across many different locations, the delivery of a land acknowledgement sounds a bit different. I'm here today representing the Archives of Ontario, which is located in Toronto. I also happen to be joining today's virtual session from Toronto on the traditional territory of the Huron-Wendat, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Anishinaabe, notably the Miss Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation. Toronto is also governed by Treaty 13, or the Toronto Purchase, between the Canadian government and the Mississaugas of the Credit. Many Indigenous nations have long-standing relationships with the land on which our facility is located that precede the establishment of the Archives of Ontario. The records in our collections hold connections to individuals, families, communities, and nations across the land now known as Ontario, far beyond the information a finding aid can describe. As the Provincial Archives and the second largest archives in Canada, the Archives of Ontario seeks to engage Ontarians with a specific type of documentary history, yet we recognize that telling the story of the past takes many forms. Many of these forms predate the records housed in our vaults. Many cannot be told based solely on the records that we preserve. It's important for us to connect this acknowledgement with our day-to-day -day work. In my own work at the Archives, I'm directly involved in determining how and when we provide access to records depicting the histories of Indigenous peoples in our Ontario through our exhibits and our educational programming. And I work to create space and feature the voices and knowledges of Indigenous institutions, communities and individuals in conversations with the records in our collections and also with our institution. And our collaboration with Tracy May Chambers is one of these opportunities for conversation. So all of this work requires self-reflection, determination, and the will to change. And we recognize it's our responsibility to take on the work of meeting each commitment, to acknowledge the lands on which we're meeting today. And all of the, you know, those of us who are joining from various different places, we must also acknowledge the path forward. So I now encourage all of us to reflect on where you're joining from in the, um, and you know, the, uh, including any traditional inhabitants and any treaties that may cover those lands uh, where you live and where you work and where you're joining from today. And now I'd like to introduce John Roberts, Chief Privacy Officer and Archivist of Ontario. Thank you very much, Alison, and uh, welcome everyone today. It's a, a pleasure to, to welcome you to this virtual talk with Tracy May Chambers uh, at the beginning of Archives Awareness Week. So as part of the Archives Awareness Week program, I did want to just take a couple of moments to reflect on the ways in which archives contribute to our, our society. Uh, we're probably most familiar with the role that archives play 
in enabling us to access our history and our shared experience through the availability uh, and research into our local records. Uh, in our case, as the Archives of Ontario records that tell of the Ontario experience. But archives also serve to provide accountability uh, through access to evidence, evidence of uh, actions of institutions such as government that do allow for longer term journeys of uh, justice seeking uh, and reconciliation. And of course, as Alison mentioned in her work particularly, archives are not just for scholarly researchers or for those seeking access in important uh, cases of, uh, of justice and uh, uh, accountability, but serve as a broad educational resource for students of all levels. And in making uh, the serving these various functions, we always try to, to be creative uh, and diverse in the ways that we engage, never more so than in Archives Awareness Week, uh, which is an opportunity to reflect on the significance of archives each year uh, in the week beginning at the start of April. The collaboration that we have this year as part of the program with Tracy May Chambers brings together two key themes uh, in our work. Uh, firstly, our interest in supporting contemporary art and also a commitment uh, and uh, dedication to the re reconciliation journey. The Archives of Ontario uh, has a, a very long standing relationship with artists uh, in the province and indeed uh, we're recognised as the first public art collection in Canada, the Government of Ontario Art Collection, which dates from the 1850s and is incredibly diverse. Paintings, murals, uh, indoor and outdoor sculpture, furnishings, decorative objects. Uh, if any of you have visited uh, Queen's Park, you'll have seen many of our artworks uh, on display. And similarly, uh, they are present in uh, courthouses and institutions and buildings right across the province. And since the Archives of Ontario took over this, uh, this wonderful collection in 2001, uh, we've really sought out opportunities to work with contemporary artists uh, on exhibits and build a collection that is relevant to the issues of today and supporting creative uh, endeavour throughout the uh, throughout the province. So we also seek to champion artistic production, not simply preserve the works of the past. And in doing that, look to engage with interesting, novel and immediately relevant uh, forms of art, bringing them into the workplace and into public areas, such as uh, the installation uh, that, that Tracy May has uh, uh, worked on at the Archives of Ontario site. Perhaps even more profoundly, uh, our collaboration with Tracy May is an opportunity for us to, to reflect on and demonstrate our commitment to decolonization and support for reconciliation with Indigenous peoples. Alison mentioned the way in which we try to create space for Indigenous voices within the institution, both its physical space, its collection and its outreach programs. And indeed, our work is very much about understanding the impact of government on peoples throughout the province and paying just uh, paying tribute to, to experiences and helping through various ways, both through the artistic work uh, and through access to our records, uh, that individuals have a safe and welcoming destination where they can come to terms with stories and, uh, and engage in that reconciliation journey. So we do that through working with groups that are seeking to understand the legacy of residential schools through challenging ourselves about the way our, our records are, are documented and described in the language that is used. And of course, by engaging with work such as Tracy May's that brings events into focus through artistic uh, reinterpretation. So it's been an absolute pleasure to, to work uh, uh, on this uh, collaboration this year. Uh, and I know you're not here to listen to me, so I'll hand over to, to Lanny uh, to, to introduce the main event. Thank you, John. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm Lanny. I'm the curator for the Government of Ontario Art Collection. Um, I'll just uh, introduce by Tracy May by saying that we were absolutely thrilled when she first contacted us uh, to propose her project for our space. Uh, we do view artwork as another form. We're really excited. Um, we hope that this installation connects the archive new audiences, artists, craftspeople uh, through various forms of records and artwork. Um, I'd like to turn it over to Tracy now at this time to tell us more about her project, uh, Hope and Healing Canada. Um, just a reminder again that if you do have a question, 
to please add it to the Q&A, uh, which is, I believe, at, Rob said it was at the top of your screen, a little bubble with a question mark um, or along the side. And uh, we look forward to that conversation um, once Tracy's, Tracy May's presentation uh, is completed. And uh, Tracy May, we look forward to hearing from you. So I will turn it over to you now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and thank you for the introduction, everyone. I appreciate it immensely and, and I appreciate being here. And to everyone that's in the audience, thank you for taking the time out today. Um, I hope you're all enjoying your lunch and um, and listening at the same time. And please feel free to ask any questions. I, I don't mind at all. Um, so if we want to start uh, with the first slide, Rob, that'd be great. So this project, I'm hoping that you've seen it in the archives window, and if not, there will be a photo of it um, within this uh, talk today. So um, just to give you a background, I began this project. Uh, I was having trouble sort of sorting out what I wanted to do next and lacked direction, I think, and just motivation. I think a lot of people shared that that uh, feeling at, well, as the pandemic rolled along and rolled along and <laughs> just kept rolling along. Um, and I, I wanted to be able to tap back into my my creativity and, and, and see what the best way forward was that from that, um, from how we were feeling as a country, um, as a society and, and across the world, this whole um, event that happened and affected every single person on the planet. Um, and if you wanna move to the next slide, Rob, Thank you. So the I made a list. It was a long list. <laughs> so these are the ones that are are, are most poignant. Um, when I decided on this project, it was when the first um, children had been discovered, and it it was to me a, illustrated the lack of connection between settlers and indigenous communities, and so I felt that originally. But I also felt these other feelings at the same time. And I'm sure many of you felt the same way or in addition to these had other feelings, but I felt ho hopeless, really hopeless. Um, and, you know, that led to feelings of depression and I was this afraid of COVID. And then I was seeing things that were happening in the United States. I actually was in the United States for six months at the beginning of COVID and in the deep south. And it was horrible <laughs> so um and that made me even further sad and confused and it was it was horrible it's, and i know understand and recognize that the pandemic has been and continues to be uh, um detrimental to everyone and hopefully we're we're moving out of this um yeah so if we move to the next slide rob thank you so i decided that um, installation work was the best way to address how I was feeling. I am a sculptor predominantly, um, but I, I, I couldn't find a way to convert that, those feelings into um, sculpture that was accessible and, you know, be able to really reach people um, across a wide demographic. So through these installations, I'm trying to communicate that we are still connected. Um, although that's sometimes hard to see, isn't it? It's, it's hard to recognize um, that we are connected to our neighbors, we are connected to our families, but we're also connected to the people who are in our greater communities and communities sometimes that we don't necessarily see on a daily basis, and that being the Indigenous Inuit Métis people of Canada. Um, so when I started writing, I, I just write sort of random things in a book and then try to pull those things together into something that's cohesive. Um, and I found myself just like deconstructing my own ideas about superiority, especially when I was down in the States um, and, and how uh, colonialism affected people in different ways and and that level of privilege um it, particularly where i was 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 uh, insurmountable i can't i can't even describe the the way that it was down there but anyways um and i i recognize that that is here as well but it was most 
most certainly more distinct uh, when I was in the United States. So I was trying to sort of sort out how I would felt about decolonization. So I started writing about that as well. So I don't know, I, I know what decolonization looks like to me, but I don't know how that applies to the larger world um, and how it necessarily works with institution, within institutions such as the archives or in other spaces. Um, and I appreciate specifically the archives for allowing me to and welcoming me to do an installation in their space because much of the truth of our civilization here in on Turtle Island comes from places like the archives. And in order to move forward with the truth and reconciliation, um, we need to address that truth in order to be able to move forward into reconciliation, which is, and part of that is decolonization. So I looked at my own work and about, and I looked about, or looked around at the unbalanced power dynamics in our civilization and, and what that looked like within my own life. Um, and I realized that colonization was at the root of a lot of those feelings than the way I was looking at the world. And I wanted to sort of tear that down um, in my own life before I started looking outwards. And it was fairly easy to do because we didn't have anything else to do. <laughs> And I was at home in my own space, so it was easy to look at myself really, really deeply and look at my my own family and sort of tear that down. And we're ready for the next slide. So if you have seen the photographs of any of the work, and I urge you to do so, the, the um, best place to see them is on Instagram, and you just look up my name and it'll come up on Instagram. And you'll notice that they are all red. And as much as I would love to use other colors, red was the correct choice for this body of work. Yellow was my favorite color, but obviously it was far too cheerful for something, you know, as, as serious as this issue is. So I used red because it represents power and anger, um, but it's also a racial slur. So that was a, a big reason for me to use it. Um, it's, you know, we use it for red stop signs because it, it indicates danger and um but it can also be courage and oh my gosh i'm so sorry <laughs> my bad um but it also re represents um power and courage and i wanted to to you know have that involved in in the work that i was doing as well um and i think how visible it is against whatever the background is, whether it's inside or outside, whether it's winter or spring or summer, it doesn't matter. It's, it is a mirror to how invisible Indigenous, Métis or Inuit people are within Canada, within Canadian society. So that was another reason to use the red as well. And we can move on, Rob. So I started in my own space. So the space on the left is actually my own um, living room. And you can see yellow is my favorite color because I have yellow chairs that no one's allowed to sit in. <laughs> so my husband was away for a weekend and I decided, OK, I'm going to take apart one space in my house and I decided on the living room. So I took everything out aside from the couch and the chairs and the coffee table. And I put back only the things that were of particular importance to me. So one of them is, a, there, there's a couple of my own sculptures and there's a ton of photographs of my family and I, you know, a teapot of my grandmother's and a couple of other things and that was it. And when I looked at the pile, which I did not photograph, <laughs> of other things, the other accoutrement that was in my living room, I realized, why do I have all that stuff? And that commercial, sort of viewpoint of the world um, is not an Indigenous worldview. So all these other things that I collected because, you know, having 15 pillows on the couch is pretty. Um, I was doing just sheerly because it was pretty and because I've trained, been trained to think that more is more, right? So I was going, it was counterintuitive for me to be doing that. And I can't profess to have an Indigenous worldview if I'm not attempting as best as I can to, to 
illustrate that in my own life. So that was a real awakening for me. And yes, I did put some things back, but I a lot of that stuff was donated because I realized that I'd fallen into this sort of trap of of purchasing, you know, whenever I wanted, whenever I wanted it. So on the right hand side is actually our parking garage. Um, we live in a new building that's filled with students um, and the decadence of the cars that are driven I found strange um, considering the first car that I bought. Uh, well, I mean, you all have the same stories, I'm sure. It was a not a very good car. <laughs> it didn't cost me money and I was in school and it's it got me point A and point B almost all of the time. Um, and yet most of these kids in the building that I'm in drive cars that I could never ever afford. Not now and not certainly not then. So another part of capitalism is that consumer um, connection to consumers in order to propagate this. We must purchase whatever it is that are out there that they are selling us. So it was kind of interesting to me to sort of tear those two places within my own home. Um, and they're the only two places I could go to. <laughs> so it was literally starting at home. So we're ready for the next slide, Rob. Thank you. So one of the first places that I was able to install at was the art gallery in Grimsby, Ontario. And in this installation, which was outside, in the photographs, in order to fit on PowerPoint, they have to be fairly small. Um, but this actually, when if you're further away from it, looks like a tornado. So it is centrifugal um, in, in motion. I wanted to illustrate motion. Um, as though, uh, you know, I was attempting to change the facade of an art gallery. It tends to be that the art, uh, art galleries and museums and even the archives are intimidating spaces. And people that are marginalized, whether it's economically or socially, are not comfortable coming into places like that. I'm still uncomfortable at the Art Gallery of Ontario, and I've been there a million times, but I still feel a certain degree, and I think a lot of people do, a certain degree of the opposite of welcoming, right? I feel like I, you know, I'm not, that I don't belong there. And those kinds of things tend to be a colonial view too, because it's a classist sort of worldview. And that is why it was so important to me to be able to create at spaces that would be traditionally not welcome to everyone and um yes so art galleries and museums and and places like that are certainly places that are high on my list of priorities um and rob if you want to okay thank you um so the other places that i installed at the very beginning of this um this is actually the art gallery in Queenstown, Ontario, Riverbrink Art Gallery. And I found out after I'd done the installation that here, they, that First Nations warriors and Métis fighters fought alongside the British soldier, soldiers and settlers against the Americans. And I was, like, I felt so wonderful. Had I known that before, I probably would have done a different kind of installation, but I didn't. I didn't know that I was dealing with it only as the the gallery itself. And and that changed my my view of the world because then I was looking at, okay, I just completely missed something that was so important about this space. And from then on was conscious of not only the current um, use of a space, but obviously its history um, and how that connects to to my own family and to Indigenous people um, who reside in Canada now. So I wanted to, to look at that as I was traveling or as I am traveling across Canada. Um, and the next slide. Thank you. So this body of work, um, it, it, it's the a juxtaposition between being political and pretty. So I went to Queen's Park and it was under construction and, and COVID was happening or whatever. But at that point I was allowed to travel. And I just sat and sewed, um, it's a 25 foot braid. Um, 
this is where they they put me and that's great that was as close as I could get at that time and just doing it in the sight of the parliament um, and just try to think about how how that made me feel being there and 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 how represented I am or am not within that space, both as being female and as being Métis. H how am I represented there or am I represented there both in a negative and positive light? So it was a great space to create um, just because it, it got, I, I ended up with lots of writing afterwards about how I felt about being there. And, but I also feel it's just in my nature to, to make things pretty. So uh, this is at the Tom Thompson Gallery on your right hand side. And I found I, I spend a lot of time making roots to the ground and, you know, these, this new growth from flowers or trees to the treetop itself and just connecting the, the who, those who've gone before us and connecting us to to the new growth um so it's it's hard sometimes for people to see this as both of those things they either see it as political or they see it as pretty <laughs> so sometimes i have a hard time with that but but it you know it doesn't matter the the fact is is that it, it is a political intervention into a space that is traditionally not welcoming to everyone. Um, and the next slide. Thank you. <sighs> okay, so um, sorry, it's always a big sigh before this series of photographs I'm going to show you now. This is Shingwok Residential School in Sault Ste. Marie. This is actually the Anglican Church that was built on the, the grounds in front of Algoma University. And it's um, a lot of the uh, furniture that you see in the photographs on the left hand side was built at the wood shop at the residential school and i found that really hard to stomach um just because well not just because because the skills that were taught at these schools were not equatable to to use within the world the greater world teaching a young man woodworking, an, an Indigenous young man woodworking, he can't leave that school and be hired by a, a, you know, a settler woodworking shop because he's not going to be hired. And there are no woodworking shops on his reservation. So it just seemed, yeah, the, the whole time, not the whole time, but quite a lot of the time I was working there, I was, I thought it was just obscene that this work was being done to build a church for parishioners, not the students, but for parishioners um, by people who had a different worldview of religion and whatever that means to individuals. You know, each person is, is very different in their um, spiritual self. So I, I, it was a hard space to work in um, for a variety of reasons, obviously. So the book that you see in the right hand side that has a is red colored is actually the list of the children that they know um, are in the graveyard adjacent to the school. Those are the ones that they do have records of. It is really disturbing um, when you read the the dates, names and dates of these children and how how little they are. These are these are tiny children and it, it's just you I mean you all know um the terrors of this the stories that we've heard i know you've all heard lots of stories and when you think about your own children if you have children or you know someone with children how that would feel to to not have that child and then i see these names in here and the children are buried next to an anglican church and they're certainly not anglican you know it's it just was a terrible it's a terrible feeling being there um, this was a really hard place to work in um, and not just because there was no heat <laughs> and it was super cold. So I was looking for a large, um, a stick or, or something to, to a pole because I couldn't reach and there was no large ladder. And I actually found a box of hymn books. So the books that you see on the floor at the front of the church is or are um, adult hymn books and adult Bibles. And they're all open 
and the ones heading out of the church are turned upside down and have read the red thread is is laid upon that and i wanted to hopefully hopefully illustrate the fact that um within the church itself whoever it is that still who believes in that anglican faith that book is still open and as they're these children are exiting the church the book is face down and i'm hoping that they have let that go let go of of you know whatever it was that they were I don't want to use the taught, but taught, but indoctrinated during that time. I hope they've let that go, let go of those, you know, the shame and all of the feelings that come with um, religion. I'm hoping they've let that go as they've exited that building. It actually does uh, follow straight out to the front steps of the church and down the steps. Um, it's a very, very large space. So it was, um, I was unable to photograph it all in one shot also because there's not a whole lot of light um, at the end of the day um, due to the season so places like this i'm doing the, the installations not because i'm trying to decolonize that space i'm just trying to pay homage to the the students that resided there and to the survivors um, who allowed me into the space and i'm so honored that they did um, but it was a really tough space um, to work in. Um, and if Rob, you could slip to the next slide. Um, so these are new installations at um, Stratford Art Gallery. Um, I, I just want to apologize quickly. I don't know if you can hear in the background that my dog is having a nightmare. So I'm, I'm hoping not. <laughs> but if you are, she's fine. She's asleep. She's just having a nightmare. So. <laughs> These are new installations, very larger installations that are at the Stratford Art Gallery, um, which again is an interesting space to work at considering um, that it's a, a throwback to the British Empire and, and you know, the plays that happen there are, are traditionally, um, you know, settler driven and, and things like that. So it, it, I just I like working in Stratford because of that specifically. So I've done a couple of installations there and these are larger uh, crocheted pieces that I, I did this this past winter. Um, OK, Rob, thank you. I, I, I must tell you that this is the first time I've split up the residential school slides just because I find if I do them all in a row, <laughs> I'm I'm a little tongue tied by the end of it because it's it's a lot to take in. So this is actually at Black Creek Pioneer Village in Toronto. And the schoolhouse that is, if you've been on that site, the schoolhouse that's there is a template of the schoolhouses that Egerton and Ryerson developed um, that were to be used for residential schools. So I, I understand that there are people who, that this is a split conversation, uh, obviously, or maybe not so obviously, I'm on one side of this conversation in regards to who this person was. Um, so when I was there, I created an installation that uh, elevated the, the teacher's chair, the authoritative teacher's chair at the front of this classroom and created a crocheted, on-site created a crocheted sort of tangle to represent colonialism above that chair, which was supporting that educational model um, to get the uh, Indian out of the Indian, so to speak. So the there is a train of um, thread that comes off of that and goes up the aisle between those two um, boys and girls section of the school and the there was a distinct cut between the front of the school and the students of the thread it's a straight cut um, and it, that can either illustrate that there the connection between those two things are cut or that there never was one a, a connection or a relationship of a viable relationship between those two while I was creating here um, it dawned on me uh when you got to the front of the classroom the chairs were tiny and you go to the back the chairs are larger and i worked from the back of the classroom to the front and realized how tiny those chairs were and again was struck with how small some of these children were when they were taken from 
their homes. And that was really tough. And so what I ended up doing was building a longhouse over top of the chairs. Um, another building, this, uh, this building had no electricity. So by the end of the day, it was very difficult to take photographs because there was no, um, there was no way to do so. So I, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to see it. I understand that in the photograph, but I, I wanted to bring those children back into the longhouse and have them protected and loved and cherished. Um, by their families and by the community at large, both the Canadian community and um, our Inuit, Métis and Indigenous brothers and sisters. Um, and to the next slide, Rob, thank you. Um, this installation is at, or sorry, I just took it down, my bad, at the Guelph Museums. Um, within this photo, it is hard to tell, but on the left-hand side, in the top, of the right hand corner of the windows in the left hand slide or picture, there is a point, a center point. And that center point does actually line up with a round uh, stained glass window in the church that's next door to, it's a Catholic church next door to the museums, the uh, museum, sorry. Um, because I wanted to look at that church from an indigenous view an indigenous indigenous lens. So I I made this sort of stained glass window created with a thread looking out at this church. Um, the, the view on the right hand side is actually at nighttime so you do see the thread a little more clearly but it's a very large uh, window three stories high and it was covered in in thread looking through at this church and how the you know, I, I tended to be thinking about the relationship between um, the church and Indigenous people on Turtle Island. It, given the uh, the trip that just happened to the Vatican, this this is an interesting slide to me, just because the you know the things that are happened and and whether you view that in a positive or negative light, that's still a it's still you know, addressing one of those 94 recommendations within the Truth and Reconciliation document that, you know, this is something we need to talk about, um, our relationship to religion or the relationship to religion um, and how how we can address that and how to even decolonize that. I'm, I'm not even sure how that's approachable, but something like an apology is a step in the right direction. The building itself um, that I'm in, the Guelph Museums, was actually a nunnery. And so there at the on the front of this building, there is also stained glass windows. So it was like I was creating from the inside, both mirroring the, the stained glass windows that are, is at the church, but also the stained glass windows of this place that protected the nuns. And that felt poignant to me because, and I, I, and I, I struggle with this because I know that it offends some people, but, there was no protection against the nuns for the children within the residential school system. And I, I yeah, so I just, it, it is a difficult conversation and I recognize that decolonization, um, what that means to different people and how they perceive it. And, you know, it, there's a whole realm of, um, feelings about that from hostile to completely open to that which obviously the archives is but there are spaces that are not not as open to that kind of a conversation let alone a change um, and if you want to go to the next slide Rob so we have another residential school here this is the Mokahawk Institute in Brantford um, adjacent to the Woodland Cultural Center this tree and of right now, the name of the type of tree just went right out of my head. So, um, so he's been here for quite some time. It's an old tree, and I wanted to install here with the view of the residential school because there would have been children who would have sat under this tree and um, would have interacted with this tree and perhaps climbed this tree. And so I created again those roots to the ground and this 
um, trunk up to the new growth. And I wanted to, again, have that conversation between the, you know, the elders that have gone before us and and children that are still to come. What's interesting, a couple of things happened within this site that were really wonderful um, and really horrible. One of them was the entire time I was, time I was working, the um, Geronimo, who is a survivor of this residential school. Sorry, <laughs> one sec. <laughs> was doing the land survey uh, in the field next to me. So it was a tough installation um, because they were going up and down with the um, machine. And it was really, <laughs> I really wish I'd been there at a different day. It was a hard day to work there. A positive thing <laughs> was that the cameraman that fil filmed the installation while it was installing. I'm really sorry, guys. <laughs> My bad. I'm very sorry about that. <laughs> so the cameraman that was installing that day brought his son with him. Um, and he was about, well, he'll be 12, 12 or 12. He'll be 12 now. He actually helped me the whole day. Um, so I would throw the yarn up into the tree and he would wrap it for me and throw it back down for me. And it was wonderful. Um, so I worked for, with him for the whole day, which was great. And um, he was a whole wealth of information. He told me the creation story that his grandfather had told him. He told me how to skin a rabbit and I'm vegan. So that was horrible. <laughs> that was, that was, uh, I, I really wish I could have covered my ears for that story, but he was so enthusiastic and excited that I, I loved listening to him. It was a wonderful, wonderful day. And I'm looking forward to telling that story when I um, write the book that is accompanying these installations because Geron oh, see, this is terrible. <laughs> it is so hard to talk about these particular things. It's just, ugh. anyway, Geronimo's to the right of me doing the land survey for the children that they know are buried there. This young man is up in the tree helping me do this installation and his father is behind me videotaping it. And I'm making this thing that is connecting those three things. And that is part of decolonization too. Just, just us being there and just them still being there and Geronimo being there and this young man being in as part of this installation shows the strength of indigenous communities and the resilience of indigenous communities. And, um, sorry, and, and telling those stories and talking about those stories within the, the context of re reconciliation is so incredibly important. And as hard as it is, as long as we keep moving forward, it will, become easier and easier to have those conversations because people will be more comfortable. And that is so important, um, being able to talk um, and, and say how we feel about things on both sides of this. Um, Rob, if you want to move to the next one. OK, so this slide is from the Craft Council in Toronto. Um, it's one of the first ones that I created when I was sort of experimenting with how I would create in spaces that um, do in fact carry arts and crafts created by Indigenous, Inuit and Métis um, people, but they're, they tend to be, pe it, historically those people would have been taken advantage of and in a lot of instances still are. So. That is part of decolonization too, is recognizing the worth of something, um, whether it's arts or crafts or writing or, or whatever it is, that, it, that what is that worth in comparison to something else? Um, and look, and in that space, there happened to be a couple of um, artists that I know personally, Inuit artists that I know personally, and that was an interesting 
um, conversation in my own head, which, you know, sometimes happens. <laughs> and it, so I was creating in a space where their work was being sold um, and at market value, and, and that's great, but, but or, um, historically, it wouldn't have been at, at market value. It would have been market value that they would sell it, but certainly not at market value for what the artists should have been paid for it. And, you know, I can, I feel that sort of, um, you know, crime that happened within the arts and crafts community um, and, and hoping that decolonization and reconciliation pulls that apart and puts it back together again in a, in a construct that works for everybody instead of just um, for people who are taking advantage. Um, and the next one, Rob. I just want to touch quickly again about um, the structure of spaces and how they could be unwelcoming. So sometimes it's things that people we don't even think about. But if you have to, oddly enough, if you have to ascend a, a whole lot of steps to get up to something and you're looking up at something, it's awe inspiring sometimes because it's beautiful, sometimes because it's in intimidating. And this is one of the spaces where I felt that that was the case. What's interesting is this was a bank before. And of course, we're all intimidated by banks. Maybe some of you aren't, but most of us are. And and so it was interesting to me to be able to create in a space like this where it's not necessarily a welcoming space and is an, yet another space that needs to be decolonized. Um, and the next one, please. Um, I use shapes in the installations because I want to, the shapes themselves tend to be dense. If you've noticed, if you notice perhaps in the ones that were in um, Stratford that I hang from the trees, there tends to be something that uh, has more density to it and then it, it radiates out into something which is just single lines. And the reason I use that is because I want to illustrate this, that we tend to have this center unit of people that we rely on and, are, and are, talk to and are part of their lives. And then it, it, you know, it spreads out from there. And, but no matter what, it still spreads out and they're still connected. It doesn't matter where they go, but they're connected to another unit, right? And I, I want to illustrate that within this, the context of, decolonization that as we reach out this way we are actually reaching another community another family right another set of people who have a common interest even something like that so creating the shapes within sort of this web of colonization is a lot of times how i'm thinking about things when i'm looking through and i think as we start taking apart institutions or in institutional viewpoints, maybe that's what we're doing is we're we're pulling apart those little threads until we can get to that center thing, which is really where we all are connected together. Um, instead of looking at it as it's all sort of this chaotic mess of things when it's really not, it can be pulled apart and put back together again so that it's more interlaced between these communities. Um, and the next slide. Thank you. So this, I get this question a lot. I've been creating these installation, installations since um, mid-July of 2021 and have gone through tens of thousands of yards of, of yarn. And I, there's lots of people who say, who have commented, oh my gosh, look, what do you do with that? And it, I actually reuse the yarn. I take it apart. This is what I, to the left is what I get sent back, um, as well as the structures. And to the right is that, you know, hunk of wool there um, rolled up because I do reuse it. The whole point of doing that is that, uh, is that capitalism is not an indigenous worldview. Um, within a community, an indigenous community, things are shared uh, historically. And so the, the, if I threw that out, it, I become part of that capitalist viewpoint of, of acquiring. And I just would start with fresh thread. And yes, it probably would be so much easier, but it defeats the whole purpose. The second reason I take it apart is because I'm going to reuse it in another place. 
So when you see the installation at Xinguac, the thread that was on the floor that was on the children's hymn books and Bibles, that thread is reused and made into something else. The flower that was, I'm not sure if you could see it in those photographs, but there was a flower hung from the ceiling of the church, crocheted flower that was about four feet wide at its outer circle, um, went to the Sault Ste. Marie Museum because that, my family is from there. Um, so the, the, you know, I felt that was a particular importance to me for to I put the installation up, I photographed it in the church, I took it down and then the next day the the flower was put into the Sault Ste. Marie Museum because to me that was a connection and now that is on its way back to me and I will take that with me when I head out west and it will be at another residential school site and I want that. I want there to be some some connection as it crosses the country. So it's a not just you know in the ether kind of connection it's a tangible connection and and i and i want that the stories from this place travel physically travel to another space in in canada wherever that east or west doesn't matter and that is a more indigenous world view where we're looking at it in that way that we reuse that instead of just throwing it away um and the next slide please um and th so these are two installations that I did. This, these are in 2022 um, in two gallery spaces on um, Lake Huron. And again, th these I like to call them interventions because it's into a space where there's there has not been a whole lot of Indigenous artists, if any. And one of the spaces there has never been. And that's a great place to be. I was incredibly honored to be there at the same time as being a little PO'd, right? So it was a, uh, it's a great space to be. And on to the next one. This is at the Hamilton Art Gallery. Uh, the larger pieces represent the community at large. The rips in the center illustrate the rips in our communities, and they're actually sewed in a little bit, meaning that they they can be healed. And to the next one. And there's that flower on the left hand side. And um, that was the one that was at the Xinguac Residential School. And to the next. Um, yes, and I just want to illustrate that this is the flower again uh, at a smaller, it's a smaller flower. I just keep adding to the flower itself. It'll just get bigger and bigger as I add more wool to it. And the next one, and this is you, the Archives of Ontario. So again, just looking out and looking in with an Indigenous viewpoint. We're, it, this photograph is looking into the museum and I want people to be able to see it through my lens, through my, to, through my viewpoint. Um, and I, I, again, I want to thank the Archives of Ontario so much for allowing me to work there. It was so wonderful and everyone who came to visit me was so wonderful. I appreciated it so much. It was so encouraging to have those conversations and a conversation at large um, speaking about this work and about decolonization and what that looks like and just intervening by having an Indigenous artist on site. And everyone, I really appreciate you coming today and I'm hoping that you will um, this slide could just stay up if you wanted to. Um, just if you just have any questions, please feel free to ask. Uh, I don't mind answering anything, so so please go ahead and do so. And thank you so much, everyone. I really appreciate it. Well, thank you very much, Tracy May. Uh, I certainly enjoyed your presentation. That was uh, very illuminating. Um, we do have some audience questions, uh, but I, I know we're we're just a few minutes away from one o'clock, so um, I think we, we do have time for a few of them. First, maybe about your background. I'm I'm sorry, you went in and out there. Oh, my apologies. Um, That's okay. One of the audience questions, one of the audience questions was just about your, if you could talk a little bit about your background. Uh, my heritage or my, or is that what they mean? 
I think that's <laughs> okay. most likely what they're asking. Yes. Okay. Yes. Like, what does that mean? I'm I'm Métis. My family is from uh, uh, Sault Ste. Marie, but before that, they were from Drummond Island. And yes, so Métis. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll read another one here. Um, you mentioned that sometimes it's difficult for viewers to think of your work as both political and pretty. Um, and this audience member was wondering, you know, it's often best to describe artworks in both a celebration of their aesthetic qualities and the underlying messages they communicate, um, because otherwise these messages could be shared through a different medium than art. So I love your work for the way it simultaneously is pretty and political. Um, Thank my you. <laughs> question is, could you share some of the audience responses to your work that you've received? And have you had any responses that made you look at your own artwork differently or shaped some of the later installations you've made? Oh, yes, absolutely. Um, so almost all of the interactions with people are positive. It's it's amazing and people get it, which is kind of weirded me out at the beginning because I thought it was a little too frou-frou, but it, and that's not, yeah, frou-frou is probably, there's a better word than that, but yes. So no, people have been really on board. They get it as like, they get, they get the connection. They get the, the use of the yarn as a connection, as a literal connection, which is great. Um, and have their comments changed the way that I've done it? I don't, I, I just, that they like the more complicated uh, work that, and that representing how uh, tangled colonialism, co colonialism is within our community, our structures of our community, the institutions in our community, if that makes sense. <laughs> Yeah, wonderful. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for, for one more here. Um, this person says, hello, I'm a professor of anthropology at Western University. We often have talented Indigenous students working on some of the difficult issues you touched on today. We are always wanting to be sure that they are supported as best they can be when the work gets so hard. What mm. kind of strategies do you use for self-care uh, or sitting with such emotional work? I make more work. I know that sounds stupid. I know it does, but I just make more work because it just sort of, it's, it sounds so stupid, but it just translates into the next piece of work. And so it's just this constant flow. I, I honest to gosh, when I finish next fall, so the last day of this work is September 30th, 2023. I'm not, I'm, I'm going to stop at that point. And at that point, I'll start working on the book. And then, you know, so I will just transfer it into the next body of work. And it seems to be working for me. Um, yeah, I just physically put it into the work. That sounds so silly. <laughs> but honest to gosh, that's how I do it. Well, that's uh, that's really helpful, Tracy Bay. And maybe that ties in a little bit more to some some of these other questions we're receiving, which are are wondering about what your what your next work uh, might be, or where do you see this work going? What is what are, what is next for you? Oh my gosh, I have no idea. I, I I really don't because this project. I mean, there's I have like a hundred left to do, so I I can't even see past Red Thread at this point. <laughs> Maybe I don't know if there's any life after <laughs> Red Thread. It's it's just so it's taken over my whole life. So I'll go back to sculpture that I know, <laughs> so I can use some colors. <laughs> um, and and if anyone out there has any questions, just you can email me. Like certainly feel free to to look on the website and just email me. I don't mind at all. Um, or look me up through Instagram. I don't mind at all. Sorry. Go ahead. My bad. Oh no, not at all. Sorry. Um, uh, and and I was just going to ask. Um, you have plans to uh, have this installation at other locations in Ontario, and then you're going to move across Canada. Could you talk a little mm -hmm. bit more about that? Yeah. So I start. Um, I just did one. I finished a three a very large installation at the Cambridge Art Gallery in Preston. Uh, it'll be up on Instagram in the next. Well, when I'm finished here. And then, then I'm off to Montreal for the Indigenous Biennale, and then um, another very large uh, art installation um, sort of celebration in Quebec City. And then I leave for, oh no, sorry. Yeah, and then I leave for Vancouver. <laughs> and then I'm gone, I'm only home two, two days in May or something like that, and 
three days in June. Like it's there's it's quite a consistent um, traveling schedule. So th they're all over the place, um, which is great because the places like museums and galleries and, and places like archives, I have a couple of other archives at this point and and they want to talk about this and it's such a great conversation starter. Um, and that's so important because starting a conversation and then maintaining the conversation is really difficult. So if I can help with that at all, just by having, it's just start, but it's not, right? So if it can start a conversation, that makes me super happy. Wonderful. Uh, last question. Um, what happens to the red thread uh, when you're finished the installation? Uh, they're actually going to be made into blankets for the homeless, which is, insanely awesome to me so <laughs> I have a, a group of ladies that I know that have a, a knitting club and that's what we're doing with it so there's gonna be a lot of red blankets so and I and I will send them across the country because I have like it's it's at, at the point at the end of it I think I'll be well over a hundred thousand meters or yards so I I'll have a lot of blankets <laughs> so if you see red blankets anywhere they're from me <laughs> Which is so great. I'm so great that they can. I'm so grateful they can go to something so incredibly worthwhile. Yeah, that's wonderful. Well, that's very inspirational, and uh, I think that's. Uh, we'll conclude the Q and A there. Uh, I know we're just a few minutes over one o'clock, but I just wanted to thank you, Tracy May, so much for taking the time to uh, share your project with us, and uh, of course for the installation at the Archives of Ontario. Um, I also wanted to thank everyone who's involved with this project and event today, including John Roberts for his remarks, Alison, uh, Ashton um, from the Archives of Ontario, as well as Rob Irwin for his technical skills in making this uh, team live event ha happen today. Uh, and of course, I wanted to thank all of the audience members uh, for joining us and for listening and participating. So, so thank you very much. Um, I just also wanted to remind everyone that Tracy May's installation can still be seen uh, for a few more days uh, at the Archives of Ontario. Um, and please visit our website, ontario.ca slash archives, uh, for more information. Um, a re recording of this event will be available afterwards in French and English if you would uh, like to rewatch. And um, Tracy, maybe I could leave you with the last words on how people can find more information uh, about you, social media, if you want to end with that. Yeah, sure. Um, easiest way is just to put my name in uh, Google. That's fine. Just Tracy May Chambers or the hashtag Hope and Healing Canada on Instagram or Tracy May Chambers on Instagram is the best way to do it. And then my website is www.tracymay.com. -E Thanks, everyone. I really appreciate you being here. And thank you for the questions. Thank you. You've been attending today's A Virtual Talk with Tracy May Chambers in celebration of Archives Awareness Week, brought to you by the Archives of Ontario. This will end our broadcast for the day. Take care, enjoy the rest of your day, and stay safe.